Both of my parents passed through the Nazi Holocaust. They were both in the Warsaw Ghetto from uh, September 1939 to April 1943. When the ghetto uprising was put down, they were both deported to Maidana concentration camp. Uh, they were then, my father was in Auschwitz in the Auschwitz death march. My mother was in two slave labor camps. Every single member of their family on both sides, my mother and father, every member was exterminated. I had no aunt, no uncle, no cousin, grandmother, grandparent, nothing, zero. We were five people in the world. Uh, and after the war, it happened and my mother testified at several trials to Nazi war criminals uh, in Germany and in the United States. Now, Professor Dershowitz, if you go on his website, he says that my late mother was a Nazi collaborator. You know, you have to sing pretty low to start making statements like that. People think, well, there's got to be some truth to it. He's a Harvard professor. It can't be completely made up. And of course, Professor Dershowitz relies on, and I don't mean this pejoratively, I mean it literally, he relies on the Hitlerian strategy. For those of you who've read Mein Kampf, Hitler makes the interesting insight. He says, if you make a small lie, people think maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. But when you make a colossal lie, some spectacular lie, people think, it must be true because nobody can be so brazen as to make that claim unless it were true. And so Hitler says when it comes to lies, it's counterintuitive. I'm using my word. It's counterintuitive. That is to say the credibility of lies increases with the size of a lie. A bigger lie is more credible than a smaller lie. And Professor Dershowitz understands that perfectly well. And so he makes this brazen lie. His mother was a Nazi collaborator, knowing full well, even people in this room right now, though they won't admit it, are thinking, there's got to be some truth to it. Otherwise, how could he be saying it? Now, why do I bring it up? I went to the dean of Harvard Law School, Dean Elena Kagan, and I says, you know, Professor Dershowitz has that on the Harvard Law School website, which is to say it has your imprimatur on it. Don't you think he should have to take it down? That's not a violation of free speech. He has his own website. But on the Harvard Law School website, I know if I did something comparable at my university, in five minutes, you get a call, take that off. So Dean Kagan won't answer me, won't answer me. I finally put to her two questions. Number one, do you think there's any evidence for that claim of his? And number two, do you have any limits on your website about what can and can't be posted? She refuses to answer question one. And to question two, she says, we have broad limits. So I replied and said, well, broad limits does not mean no limits. So for example, Dean Kagan, if somebody posted, a Harvard professor posted on the website that Dean Kagan's mother was a whore, would you have it taken down? Well, at this point she got really indignant and she wrote back, I think we'll stop talking now. And some of you are laughing but really, ask yourself, which is more hideous? Which is more hideous? To say Dean Kagan's mother was a whore, or to say my late mother, after having endured the Nazi Holocaust in its worst, most egregious form, she's now, after her death, having this label pinned on her which, as I say, I think even people in this room secretly harbor the thought, must be something true to it, that she was a Nazi collaborator. But Dean Kagan won't make him take it down. And that's what makes him possible. It's not him. It's the institutions that protect him.